He's a frightening player. Like yeah. I, I remember playing against you boys at the wreck. You know the game you knocked me out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Rugby Pass Offload with me, Christina Mahan. And today I'm joined by Jamie Roberts and very special guest in All Black Legend, Jerome Kano. Welcome to the show, Jerome. How are you guys doing? I'm good. Um, boys are pumped. It's finals week and uh, yeah, not long till, till game time. So the boys are excited. I'm massively excited for you boys this weekend, mate. I'm uh, a good mate of mine, Al Ryan. He's my fit coach, fitness coach at Bath, um, and he's loving life there. And I speak to him uh, quite regularly. He uh, he must be buzzing. But uh, Jerome, how long have you been at Toulouse? This will be your first. Yeah, first final. Well, uh, we've had uh, I've had uh, two semi finals, but um, yeah, first final. So this is my f- going on to my fourth year. You guys are taking on La Rochelle in the Heineken Cup finals. So, how are you and the guys feeling ahead of that game? Yeah, the boys are excited. Um, the whole club is buzzing. Um, obviously, with the history Toulouse have with the Heineken Cups, but we've got such a young group that um, a lot of them are just keen to get out there and play. So, uh, game day can't come quick enough. But um, yeah, there's a huge buzz around town and around the club. Must be awesome for you, mate. I mean, you're saying this is your fourth season there. Um, and you played in a few semi-finals. You're saying like to be now in a final with a club. And bear in mind where Toulouse were. Look, when I was a kid, and um, we used to play Toulouse in my young twenties, they were finalists every year, every year. But there's been a bit of a kind of lull at the club, I guess, the last decade. Uh, but now they're finally getting back to where they belong. I, I love seeing Toulouse in finals. You guys play a proper brand of rugby. And uh, just for you personally, how special is that now to be in a final? Yeah, it's really special. Um... You know, we've had a few disappointing seasons, uh, losing in semi-finals. Um, but um, yeah, well, I think the boys have learned a lot from the last couple of years, and we're ready to to push through. But um, you know, the, this La Rochelle side, a, a special side as well. They play a great brand of rugby, and um, but um, we're just we're just keen to get out there and and play. Um, you know, with the history to lose have. Heineken Cup. So I was the same as you. I um I grew up hearing about like the golden years of Wasps rugby, Cardiff, Le- uh, Leicester Tigers, and and also Toulouse uh, and Heineken Cup finals. And uh, to be part of that history is uh, quite special. Are the players aware of that history? You know, the young lads now coming through. Are they? Is that I say forced upon them? But are they, are they aware of that? Obviously, without crowds now and things like that. Is you know, do you have that up in dressing rooms? Pictures of trophy winning sides, etc. Oh yeah, if you if you drive through the gates of Toulouse, it, the history just hits you straight away. Um, you know, we've got uh, a fence line now with uh, a lot of the um, championship winning sides, and also with, if you walk through the training centre, the the golden years and the championship sides are everywhere. And there's also a timeline of uh, what years they won top four things and what years they won uh, uh, Heineken Cups. So, uh, yeah, you can't miss it. And I'm sure the, the younger guys are quite aware of who, uh, which players were in those teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how have you gone against La Rochelle this year in the league? Um, you know, they've been pretty uh, close games. Uh, we've, we've managed to win a couple of them and uh, they, they haven't been uh, like try-scoring fests. So they've been pretty tight to uh, one in the forwards. So um, I'm not going to expect anything different this week. And... Depending on the weather, what the weather's doing, it might be the same. And uh, I've got it's some. In, it's, <laughs> mate, it's in London, bro. It's in London. <laughs> don't, don't expect it to be dry like it is in France, probably. Jeez. Are you, are you quite disappointed we're playing in the UK? All French affair. Do you kind of wish it was in France or? No, I'm, I'm quite glad it's, uh, it's yeah. in neutral ground and uh, what a place to play it at. Twickenham's quite a special place. And um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not too bothered. I just want, I'm just happy that we're in the final. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Jamie, where do you see a possible weakness that Toulouse should be looking to exploit this weekend now with La Rochelle? Oh, God, it's tough, isn't it? I watch, I watch La Rochelle against Leinster. I'm sure uh, Jerome and his teammates have watched that game uh, with a fine tooth comb going through it where they can expose them. Um, in the air, in the air, I think Wales managed to expose Bruce Dillan in the Six Nations. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if it's raining Gilberts come on uh, come the weekend, just getting up in the air. And Toulouse have got some good players who can get up in the air and win ball. Um, especially their back three. So, you know, and ultimately a lot of these games come down to that, you know, the real kind of arm wrestle affairs. Yes, 
teams will chuck it about. But if you can win the air, you know, box kicking, kicks off 10, and just win those little 50-50 arm wrestles going up for the high ball, they can swing the momentum in these games. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be fascinating how both sides approach it because, look, you both love to play rugby. You know, Toulouse are an offload inside. They all kind of track the ball really well. Uh, and the forwards are brilliant at keeping the ball alive as a La Rochelle, like when they get into their groove, they're big players who can offload the ball through contact. So I think it's a great, great final we got in store for the weekend. Um, and I suppose Jamie touched up it there. Toulouse are absolutely stacked with some of the greatest international players in the world right now. Um, and DuPont is, being, is one of them. So can you actually tell us how good he actually is? Is he the best scrum half you've ever played with? Is he better than Aaron Smith? You know, fill us in. I don't know. I wouldn't say he's better than Aaron Smith because both of them play a different style of rugby. Like uh, Antoine's a lot more abrasive. He loves taking it into contact with uh, where Aaron, he's the best distributor I've ever played with. And or I think he's the best distributor. He's got the best pass I've ever played with. And, and both, of, both of their styles seem to get their teams going and uh, play a pivotal uh, pivotal role in their teams uh, succeeding and going forward. But um, with Anton, he's just, I said it before in one of my interviews that uh, for a young guy, um, no matter what kind of pressure he comes under, he just never seems to be faced um, with uh, whatever situation he's in, whatever pressure we're in in the game. He just seems to take everything in his stride and he just wants the ball. And uh, it's a good thing for our team uh, when someone with that amount of X factor just wants the ball and does something with it. Uh, it's quite special and it's quite awesome to watch. Is he quite vocal, Jerome? Is he a player that will speak in team huddles? Is he kind of dictates how you lads play? Or I, I'm quite fascinated by that because he's quite young yeah. and Roman and Tamak alongside him as well. Is he is he one of those guys who dictates to senior players like he knows what he wants? No, I think naturally he's a quiet player. He's quite reserved. Um, yeah. I think he has to get a bit of a nudge to, to speak up. But uh, when he does, the boys do listen and uh, uh, he has the respect of the crew. But um, I think when when he has to, I think he speaks and that's, that's what's most important. But uh, I think naturally he's quite a kickback, relaxed guy. Yeah, he's a strong bloke. Jeez, yeah. I mean, I've watched him quite a few times this year, shrug forwards off of fun. Yeah. Like, he's a pocket rocket, isn't he? But proper strong, fair play to him. Yeah, yeah. he's playing well. I think, wasn't it, um, if Zeebs was on today, I'd probably ask him about it, didn't he rip the ball from Zeebs the last time they played against yeah. each other? Yeah, um, it's a shame yeah. we haven't got Zeebs on. We can abuse him for that. Yeah, he just bailed on us for today. What about uh, what about Ches and Kobe? Where, do you, where would you rank him in, you know, of the best wingers in the world? Where would he kind of come in? Yeah, he'll be up there. Uh, it's a bit hard to, to rank the best wingers uh, right now. But, yeah, in terms of X factor and feet and... Uh, Pound for pound, he's definitely one of the best. Um, uh, he's probably got the best feet that I've uh, I've played with or on par with a few. But um, yeah, for his size, he does some incredible things, and he's actually deceptively strong as well for his size. And um, yeah, to, uh, I'm just glad that he's on my side instead of having to defend him in open spaces. <laughs> He's a frightening player. Like I, I remember playing against you boys at the wreck. You know the game you knocked me out. Um, <laughs> but literally five ten minutes earlier, right, the ball is going left to right, and I'm kind of tracking across trying to defend right, and the ball's, you know, it's gone right to the edge to Cheslin Colbert, and I've I've got him lined up. I'm thinking right inside shoulder here. I've got, you know, giving it everything. I ended up tackling thin air like the bloke <laughs> just goes bang bang double step I think you let score in the corner oh, that's right, and yeah. I'm like that has never I, that's never happened to me in my career I don't think <laughs> just made to look that stupid by playing and I'm just thinking oh my god you know this is you know it was a nightmare for me because obviously I got I got set I went off the pitch and it was knocked out um your tackle and then I watched him play a few weeks later did exactly the same and he did it in a World Cup final uh yeah. bang bang you know stepped over Farrell for that for that try um, I thought I was quite lucky then. I wasn't the only only guy who's been made to look stupid by uh, him. Does he carve up in training? Is he one oh, of those yeah. players who just bosses it? Like, yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking that you're the unfortunate one that uh, has to be on TV getting getting carved up at training. Yeah. We, get it, we get it on a daily basis, so we're just lucky that it's really? not on TV. Is he humble? 
Yeah, he's very. Oh, he just, uh, <laughs> he's very he's laugh in your face. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fun. Yeah, he's supremely gifted. I mean, mm-hmm. beyond beyond the game this weekend, he's he's. If the Lions can't contain Chosen Colby, he has potential to win the series on his own. I think. Yeah. And now, just before we move on to Lions chat, I just want to say congratulations on being shortlisted for European Player of the Year. Um, like, how great does that feel to um, still be performing at, at like such a high level? At um, your age, at your age, mate. I mean, how, I how, how, old, are you? how old are you, man? I'm 25. 25. 25. All right, yeah, 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 yeah. I believe you. Oh, it's a, it's a huge honour to be shortlisted and um, to have my name up there, but. I've got to be honest, like I, I feel like there's so many other players that have played a lot better than me um, this year and um, a couple of them in my team, but also in some other teams that I've seen in the European competition this year. But yeah, uh, well, I was scratching my head when I saw, I saw myself on the shortlist when my wife showed me. I was just like, what the hell is this old geezer doing here? <laughs> but uh, it's a huge honour and um, yeah, uh, stoked. Two more years. Sign him up. No way. <laughs> <laughs> how many? How how long will you play for, mate? Do you do you put a limit on it, or you just play as long as you're performing well? You're happy to keep playing, or no? I'm uh, I'm done after this year. Um, Are you okay? Yeah, this I is going to be a last season. Uh, the mind's ready to go, but I think the body's uh, keep. He's it's been whispering to me the last year or so that uh, is it? I'm not recovering fast enough to be able to back up. So uh, I'm going to enjoy the last couple of months of uh, professional rugby and yeah, rugby me. Oh, oh that's, definitely, man. That's, that's mate, as long as, mate, that's, yeah. I mean, that's sad to hear, but I would love to see you sign off for the European Cup, mate. I think no one deserves it more, man. So Absolutely. yeah, I'm excited yeah, right? for you, boys. <laughs> now is this the case that you're gonna like retire from French rugby and then potentially go and sign for the MLR for like a year or are you oh, going go to Japan? What in Japan? No, yeah. <laughs> no or rugby. Oh. <laughs> and uh, do you think you'll go home then, Jerome, or will you sat in France or so at the moment I'd like to work with the Espas here in uh, Toulouse. Oh really? Next, okay. Um, yeah. couple of years. So that's the plan. And um uh with the way the world's um going at the moment but uh, yeah the family are happy the kids are kids are happy here as well so um okay get a couple more french summers in before we head back yeah home. definitely i mean why would you head back home? i mean is that in a coaching capacity mate do you see that as a route for you long term yeah well, for me i guess it's just another challenge um of of i've been speaking to a few of my mentors and a lot of them post rugby really struggled to get out of their team environment that was the biggest shock for them and I, I guess for me that's one of the biggest things that I'd miss when I when I finish rugby is that camaraderie that team team environment and I guess um, for me I just wanted another challenge and still be a part of the game still give the game something that you know the game's given me so much so for me to give back uh, I'd love to learn uh, the role of a coach and what they do and no better way to do it than with the youngsters. Um, I don't think I yeah. can get straight up to the pros. Um, uh, is, I'd rather take the uh, take that pressure off my shoulders and just learn as I go. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, such I wise words, such wise words, mate. Because, like, I guess you want to stay in the game, but by coaching, you also feed that kind of comp- competitive edge in it and mm. seeing players get better, seeing them perform at the weekend, whatever, in a coaching capacity, you still have that kind of competition. You can still satisfy that because we're all competitive players, aren't we? Yeah. You know, none more so than yourself. So to so hear you go, right, you're kind of passionate about coaching. I think, I'm sure it'd be a huge benefit, to, especially younger players at Toulouse. Yeah, it'd be a good challenge, but um, I think uh, my French is going <laughs> to... When you've been there four years, man, there's no <laughs> excuse. There is no excuse for you to be shit at French. Yeah. <laughs> How is your French? Is it good? I understand it better than I could reply. But, um, yeah, standard conversation. I can hold a conversation. But uh, when the different accents come and then they start speaking a lot faster, that's when I start to struggle. Well, look, with the British and Irish Lions tour approaching this summer, you're in a unique minority of players who have played against them on two different tours. So how do you see this tour shaping up? Oh, that is showing your age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's no mean feat either. Like, that's really yeah, it's impressive. outrageous. It yeah. is outrageous. Fair play. Um, I think it's quite exciting. Uh, for me, having played them, I think it's cool just to sit back and just be a spectator and not have uh, 
uh, bias to, to either side. I've got some close friends uh, in both side, both of those teams, and it's just exciting to, to sit back and see how it all pans out. Um, I think Warren Gatlin could have picked two world-class uh, alliance sides with the amount of players that he left out. But um, you know, it's an exciting side that he picked, and I'm looking forward to to them getting the tour underway, and also seeing how South Africa um, front up as well, uh, having the long layoff. Oh, so, your you first-hand experience playing with Cheslin in Toulouse, and obviously you must have spoken about the Lions. How does how would he feel about the box? They haven't played since the World Cup final mm. in 2019, so they're going to have to play a Test match now, a year and a half on. Mm. Um, in the hope of winning a Lions series, like, do you think those lads are are under pressure, or do you think that'll kind of galvanise them? Oh, I think it'll galvanise them. Uh, from what I've heard, they've still been in contact as a squad, uh, mm. probably having the odd Zoom session here and there. But I, I have no doubt that the the Springboks, will, once they put that green green and gold jersey on, they'll uh, they'll front up. And um, I think uh, a lot of the frustration being held back uh, from being in their team environment, I think it'll galvanise them. And um, no, it'll be a good good uh, series once it gets underway. That's my biggest worry. <laughs> it's my biggest worry. I think the Lions got an amazing squad, but the fact the box haven't played together, I think you, you're right there. Box at home, it will it will galvanise them. It's, if anything, it's a bigger challenge for the Lions this year than it would have been in 09 or, or 97. Because you know, with the, with the cards stacked against you, often teams come out swinging. So mm. it's a fascinating, fascinating kind of dilemma for the box, but it's going to yeah. be an awesome series. John, who do you think is going to be victorious? Can I say? You can. No, I don't know. I think um, I think it'll be close. But um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not going to say who's going to be victorious. I, I wouldn't have a clue because both sides are quite. Uh, I'm going to sit on the fence here and uh, be a neutral. Happy speaker. You're going to sit back and enjoy it. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's what you're going to do. Well, I suppose going back to 2005, you played against the Lions for Auckland. So what are your memories of that tour? Well, that was um, a while ago. A long way, yeah. I, I remember I played for Auckland coming off the bench against the Lions. And um, mate, uh, it was like playing for the All Blacks when you when we were in the Auckland uh, hotel room. All well, the lines, the Barmy Army were outside uh, singing their songs. But um, the good thing about it was when we came out, everyone was cheering for us. Uh, just walking to the bus, which is uh, for a 19-year-old, um, it was it was quite a special thing to experience. But um, one of the most special things that I got to. I've still got Martin Corey's, uh, Martin Corey's jersey uh, from that game, and that you know, was quite special for me. I really wanted to, uh, I made it a goal to make the All Blacks for that series, but I uh, wasn't able to, wasn't good enough. But um, to, to be able to experience that and, and play against the Lions, that was, that was awesome. Well, then 12 years later, you were selected and you played in each of the test matches against the Lions. Um, now, I know it was a bit of a disappointing series for the All Blacks and for yourself personally. So I'm going to go there and I know bad things come in threes, I guess. So what was it? You were subbed off in the first test after 45 minutes, subbed off in the second after half an hour, and then you got a yellow in the third. Apart from yeah. the stuff that I've just dredged up, what else are your memories from that tour? I was quite, um, I look at their test with some fond memories. Like it was, uh, it was just special to be in the black jersey playing against the Lions uh, with the history that uh, both sides have had. Regardless of the results and what, like the yellow card and also going off in the second test, I was I was just proud that um, I was able to be part of that history. It would have been, it was a bit of a hollow feeling at the end when they just called it a draw. I would have loved the extra time and just get a definitive uh, definitive uh, winner, but uh, I, I think they had pre pre made that decision. But um, yeah, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that series, but. Yeah, the last impression that I had, I would have loved to play extra time and, and get a get a winner. Yeah, I think we all thought, thought the same, mate. I was watching yeah. in a bar in Ibiza. And I, was, <laughs> I was watching just thinking, no, it's a draw. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It was uh, one of the most awkward trophy photos you'd ever uh, had. Because yeah. both teams together just going, what are we doing? It was, yeah, a, it yeah. was such a strange one. Like I remember coming away because I was obviously just watching it. And you, I felt so empty inside. Yeah. It just was really weird. It's yeah. not how you've pictured it going at all. 
But yeah. I know now you did have a brilliant battle against Sean O'Brien in the third test. It was the two of the best flankers finally put it against each other. You floored him, didn't you? Oh, I just flew in into a clean out. And I think uh, Shorty was in an awkward position. And um, I just got him on a sweet spot on his shoulder. And um, I have felt that sweet spot a few times yeah. about. It's not great. <laughs> <laughs> I felt bad for him. I, um, I went and saw him after the game and he, he was in a sling. And I, yeah, it was. For a good lad, um, yeah, I felt bad for him. I was going to say, did it finally feel good to get one up on him? Because you guys were constantly like pitted against each other as the, the best flankers in the world, and then you kind of got one up on him. Yeah, well, he, he, he's had a few shots on me um, every time we play in Dublin, so I had to get back one, uh, get one back on him. Oh, poor Shawnee. <laughs> but like, can you even can you talk to us a little bit more in detail about maybe what? went so wrong for the All Blacks on that series? Because it mainly down to, do you think that it was the, the you know, you guys were a little bit unlucky with the refereeing calls or? No, I think, um, I thought the first test was quite close and um, I thought both teams were, um, went at it, but we were lucky to get that win. But uh, I think the second test was quite, uh, it was quite pivotal in terms of confidence on both sides and, um, us being 14, 14 men, uh, uh, one man down for the most of the game. And then I think the Lions really found their groove in their game and started playing their rugby, and which gave them a lot of confidence heading into the third test. So, um, yeah, the third test uh, could have gone either way. Um, I don't think any of the refereeing decisions would have made a difference. It was just uh, those kind of games, uh, the, the similar to finals, you fine margins you only have a few opportunities to to capitalize on and i don't think we our all black team we i don't think we were sharp enough on that day to, to capitalize on the opportunities that we did get jamie actually just on that because obviously you've played for the lines so when it comes to the test does every test you play for the lines actually feel like a final in a sense is it you know how yeah, they, they're they huge games they're huge games because they only happen every four years so you know you have three test matches every four years to play for the lions if you play in it, great. If you don't, chance gone. I have to wait four years. And, you know, for the Lions, you only have um, one tour every four years. You have to remember, for the host country players, their whole career might pass without the chance of coming to play against the Lions. Jerome has been lucky to, to play against the Lions twice, uh, 12 years apart. But some players never get that chance in their career. So it's a huge, huge kind of honour and special thing for those home players to play against the Lions. They realise that, it's, you know, to do it once is a miracle if you do it twice, uh, as Jerome has done. So it's very special and you're well aware that chance doesn't come around often in your career and you have to grasp it with both hands. And it is like a final. It is like a final. The momentum from the first test is huge. The first test is absolutely massive. And the All-Bats did a job. Jerome has spoke. I think Sonny Bill's red card probably turned that second test on its head, really. Um, and the Lions got got ascendancy um but yeah they are like finals they're awesome they're absolutely awesome to play in and uh you know all the pressure comes on it's it's which team can hold their nerve i guess jerome who was the toughest member of the lion squad to play against oh uh mara was pretty tough but i'd i'd have to say someone that just kept coming was marco Unipola. He just um, has no handbrake. He just keeps going and going. He loves to get the ball in. And to, to stand in front of him and try and put a shot on him, it's uh, impossible. He's solid. He's a brick of a man. But um, I would say he'd probably be one of the... He'd be up there with the toughest uh, in that test that I played. Jamie, what are some of your memories of playing against Jerome? Oh, God, I've got a few. Um, <laughs> one would be in 2010 in Hamilton, and it was my, uh, I want to say my, it was the first, second game I played against the All Blacks. The first test we played in Carisbrook and we got, we got blown off the park. Carter, masterclass. Mm -hmm. And then the second test was, I remember it was in Hamilton and I scored a try in the corner and it absolutely leveled me over the try line. <laughs> and I, <laughs> but I scored, but it was in the, it was in the act of scoring. I was like, geez, I was winded. And I had to get up and try and look cool as if I'd scored. But I was absolutely <laughs> gasping. I was gasping for breath. Um, and then just a load of times against the OBs. I mean, you know, you can dress a back row up all you want and balance between, you know, jackling, carrying, whatever. But I think Jerome, for me, was that archetypal six, just a proper strong man, proper menace in the contact area, just manhandled players. Um, 
you know, whenever we played against him. And then obviously Bath. Bath was a was a huge game. You know, where Freddie dropped the ball behind yeah. the sticks at the death. It was a game we should have won. Um, but I just remember carrying and just catching one. I, well, I can't remember, actually. It was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a sack of potatoes in the deck. I think, you know, shot just on the chin. I think you got a yellow card, didn't you? Yeah. Um, but, though, yeah, those are the games. Some great memories playing against Jerome down the years. But I, I've got to say, I don't think I've been in a team that's beaten you. So fair play to you. Oh, there we go. And mm, I think last question point. on the Lions, but who was the Lion that you actually most look forward to sharing a couple of beers with after the games? Yeah, I, I always uh, enjoy having a beer with uh, Shawnee. Um, he's always one that I look for after an Irish test and whenever we got to hang out. But um, there was always one guy I wanted to, to hunt down was uh, Joe Marler. I wanted to... <laughs> you hear about the stories and how much of a funny man he is. You, I just wanted to see what uh, what he was like in person because some people have a TV persona and a social media persona. I wanted to see if he was actually uh, quite funny and he, he was a good bloke. He was a good man. And... Uh, yeah, the um, majority of those guys on that tour were, were good guys after the game and uh, good to have a, have a yarn with. Um, yeah. Well, look, having played 83 times across the 13 years for the All Blacks, do you think that um, New Zealand rugby do enough to look after their players and their talent? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, my time with the All Blacks, I, they, they looked after us. Uh, I think the, the number one thing for them was player welfare. Mm -hmm and uh, making sure that players were looked after and um, there was always a, a good panel of players within the, the the board, the players board and making sure that our voices were heard uh, across the board and uh, which was a good thing but um, yeah definitely when I was when we were there and what I see right now is that the players were definitely um, or the number one priority making sure that we we were happy and we were uh, our concerns were met I just seen this week Lamarpe is signed in Stade Francais. Mm. Um, now Lamarpe is a name that I would think would be around that All Blacks twenty three, if not in most squads. You know when they are picked for rugby champ or whatever. Does that concern you? How that might play out over the next couple of years, three, four, five years? That a lot of those players who are in the prime. I mean, you've come to France after your Test career, really. Um, so your Test career is finished. You, you've come to Toulouse and kind of. You know, born again, he'd been wonderful for Toulouse. <laughs> when someone like him, who is in his mid to late twenties, moves abroad, does that concern you for, for the All Blacks that someone like that has gone right? I I prefer to go abroad and experience him. And I know each player to their own; they they have to do what's good for them and their family. But does that worry you in any way? Yeah, it does a little bit. When you see some like for me, you know, I'm exactly the same. He'd be on my All Black team if I were to select one next uh, next week. But um, yeah, there could be a, a trend that follows in terms of younger players wanting to head overseas and experiencing something different and maybe getting paid a lot more money. But um, I don't know. I think uh, it might be just a one-off where uh, Nani's in a situation where he wants to try something else. He wants to take his family and, and experience the world. But, um, yeah, there's New Zealand's quite funny. There's so many players that we think uh, they won't be able to replace them and then someone else pops up and, yeah. uh, a couple more other players pop up so um, with the assembly line of uh, young talent that they have uh, in New Zealand I'm sure um, the New Zealand Rugby Union will have their eye on players that they won't want to uh, head off offshore but, off. um, yeah, yeah I mean it's quite a political really question to yeah. ask Jerome yeah it's quite a political question to ask Jerome but should that should move into France preclude him from playing for the All Blacks? I think it's the it's the rule that's been in place for a very yeah. long time. And um, yeah, yeah, uh, I think it would hurt the game uh, in New Zealand, our, our local game, if players did head offshore and were still eligible so to play for the All Blacks. Because um, you know, I think the strength of the All Blacks is the grassroots rugby and and the clubs back home, and you know, we wouldn't want that to. Uh, uh, to perish just so the top level players could uh, hit off yeah but what about now um i know finance seems to have been always been an issue for the all blacks board and i know you recently revealed that although you guys are the best team in the world you're paid merely 15 percent of what the english players are for a test week that blew my mind so like what are the steps that we need to take to make international rugby more equal because 
like you could have other players, you know, in New Zealand just going off to France because that's where the money is. Um, the career is so short lived. So what do you do? I think it comes down to numbers, uh, bums on seats. Uh, I think if we were able to uh, pack our stadiums uh, week in, week out back home, then uh, it'd probably help bridge the gap. But um, just the, the amount of people watching the game back home uh, at the stadiums, uh, it's, it's not, not, not uh, as similar as the numbers that we have over here. So, um, yeah, I, I think we have the population in New Zealand to be able to do that. But if there are other ways, uh, other avenues that they were able to bridge the gap, then I'm sure they'll be able, they'll, they'll be looking at those. But uh, as it sits right now, it's just it is what it is, and, and guys are just enjoying playing their rugby and playing for for the countries. I think, Christine, I think most countries don't own as much as England. I think their, machine, yeah. their machine is much bigger, yeah? You know, countries like New <laughs> Zealand and Wales. Exactly. The machine is a completely different machine, completely different animal, you know? Is it, and, uh, is it, a, is it the different approach as well? Like, I remember um, a friend of mine was from New Zealand, and she was saying, it's not about the money. It's, it's about the pride of pulling on that jersey. And I know it's the same for all the other nations, but does it maybe it's a little bit more, you know, it matters a bit more over in, in New Zealand? Like, the All Blacks jersey is so special. No, we're, where we are in New Zealand, we're quite fortunate. Um, <clears throat> we don't really put money into it. Like We're quite fortunate to be able to be in the position to be a professional sports person. Uh, and the All Blacks are definitely the uh, number one team in New Zealand. And to be called an All Black and to be in that environment, it's a, it's a huge privilege. And, um, and if you were in that situation and then come out and start complaining about money, it's, it's quite a... It's not a good thing. You wouldn't so, dare. Uh, you us, wouldn't dare do that. No, for us to, yeah. to be in that privileged position, it's. Uh, I think for for most guys, it's. Uh, it's more than enough. Mm. <clears throat> I think you'll find that be the same for most test players around the world, mm. Christina, as well. You know, you know, you get the privilege of playing for your country. It, it doesn't matter how much money you earn to do it. Mm. It's a huge honour, and you know, you you never complain about how much money money you earn doing it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Obviously, I am I am not an international, so um, yeah, I can't relate. But no, I think that does make sense. It's the, it's the pride of your country above everything else. Um, but look, since you left now, the All Blacks have struggled to get a settled number six. Um, now, we think they may have finally found a replacement in Akira Ione. So what do you make of him as a player? Oh, man, he's... Um... He's X Factor on X Factor, that kid. He's um, he's like his brother, Rico. They're both really quick, but um, I remember back in 2000, and I think it was 2016, 15, when he played his debut for the Blues and he's just burning backs on the outside. And uh, I, he could still do that right now. So, um, yeah, I definitely hope that he gets, uh, gets into that All Black um, team and uh, just. Uh, gets comfortable because uh, once he gets comfortable in that environment and comfortable at, at test level, I'm sure he'll be able to show the world what he's capable of. Who are the top three flankers in world rugby today, in your opinion? Top three? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know Kano's on the shortlist. Oof. European shortlist. Uh, who I really enjoy uh, watching play, loose forwards, I'd say um, Adi Sevier. Uh, Justin Tupperick, he's uh, he's I, I love watching that guy play, and um, it'll have to be oh, I'm gonna have to pick four here. I'm gonna go Sam Simmons and Gregory Aldrit here in France. Fair enough. I thought you, I was, I thought you were gonna say, and myself. Um, I was because I was gonna do no, that. I was like, he's, he's the most no humble way. man in the world. He's do you know what I'm looking forward to this weekend? Is is Big Joe Takori fit? Yep, he's fit. He's fit. I do you know what I, I want to see a collision between him and Will Skelton this weekend. <laughs> I am looking forward to it. I think I was watching Will Skelton play against Leinster oh. and he, he ran into about four blokes and still yeah. made about five meters. Right. And that's against Leinster. That's against Leinster, who are yeah. renowned for their physicality. Big mm. Joe Takori as well cuts a line off nine and can yeah. cause serious damage. So I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for it. I'm looking forward to it massively. Yeah, I think Will's one of the many big bodies they have in their La Rochelle side. So, uh, yeah, there's going to be some big collisions. Tackle practice this week. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Um, now, look, I have to ask you this question, and we ask every single guest that comes on the podcast, um, but can you give us an insight into the initiation of an All Black? Oof. And so, it's just the three of us here. It's just a circle of trust. <laughs> there's nothing. Uh, there's nothing too um, too out there that I can't say on here. But um, yeah, there are a lot of uh, like traditional um, initiations that come in. Like you obviously have to when you first uh, like the first week we have a team meeting and you have to get up there and speak on um, your journey and what uh, what 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 you're grateful for and how how you got there. But um, yeah, obviously you get an All Black book, which uh, shows your journey, your path to the All Black team, and and then the back bit of the book is empty, and that's uh, that's a chance for you to to write your history in the uh, in the All Black legacy and what you want to do and what you're grateful for and those those bits. But in terms of out there uh, initiations, there there aren't many. I think for new players coming into the All Black environment, the most important thing is knowing where your place is on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> up front by the driver or next to the coaches. So what is the story? Do you have to, as like a new player, do you sit at the front and then the more senior sits to the back? Or? Yeah, yeah, the older players sit at the back. So um, sometimes there aren't enough seats on the bus. So straight after a morning meeting before training, there's a massive sprint to, to the bus and... If we're on the top level, uh, if the meeting room's on the top level, you better take the stairs and don't wait for the lift. Otherwise, you're going to be standing up on the way to training or wherever we're going. Mate, were you back in centre? Yeah, I was back. Yeah, of course you were, <laughs> mate. Of course you were. And did any, mate, can, any instances of any young lads trying to fight their way back or being a bit above their station? Not in like, my hang time. Hang on a minute. What are you doing something like there? You've only been involved a year. No, not in my time, but uh, oh. I'll... Um, Kieran Reed and Owen Franks, they were the they were the enforcers of the back seat. They they made sure their guys went too far back. And look, you must have had some amazing nights out over the years, especially after those two World Cup victories. But if you had to pick the best night out you've ever had in rugby, what would it be and why? The best night out in rugby. Ooh. I'd say after the 2011 World Cup um, in New Zealand, uh, just well, just seeing uh, everyone around town still packed, packed in the streets and just, uh, I think it was more the relief that we, we were able to win, but um, just uh, just the happiness that we were able to bring to, to everyone, which was a, that was a, uh, that was a, a good night. I must be another level. I mean, winning a World Cup in your home country as well. I know the final was proper nerve-wracking for you oh. boys, isn't it? Yeah. Jeez, uh, the old beaver came on and slotted the kick. But... yeah. yeah. I mean, to win, uh, I can only imagine that feeling. Yeah. Mm. To, yeah, like, you know, well, your whole country at home, All Blacks win in New Zealand. Should have been Wales in the final, but we won't talk about yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, when, you, when you're in those uh, tournaments or when you're in the World Cup, you're sometimes you're stuck in your bubble and you're not really... Uh, you're not really privy to what's happening outside and then after the final we drove back to the hotel and the boys walked into uh walked down the street and just still seeing people with their flags and just packed packed out on the main road it was uh it was quite special and it's quite cool to experience when does it um when does it hit you that you've like won a world cup final like what, you know do you wake up a few days later and you're like oh yeah i remember that or you know how does that just come about you'll be on the piss for four days christine yeah <laughs> is it a delayed reaction you know yeah. after you guys kind yeah. of sober up a little bit and you're like oh i want to walk up no 2011 it hit me straight away because it was such a tense moment the last 15 20 minutes to to it felt like we were waiting forever for that final whistle but um yeah as soon as the ref blew that whistle i knew straight away that uh, that feeling hit me straight away Hit me with the dirtiest player you've ever played against. Oh, oh the dirtiest <laughs> player. We're going all out here. Cards on the table. Oof. Has to be South African. Yeah. Oh. It'd have to be um, my good mate. Uh, what's his name? He was coaching Gloucester no long ago. Ackerman. Ackerman. He, he's a good man, but geez, when he was playing, holy hell, there were some cheap shots going on. <laughs> what yeah. about now the best player you've played with and against? Best player I've played with? Uh, Dan Carter. 
best player that played against, probably Dan Carter. <laughs> um, what about your best moment on a rugby pitch? Best moment on a rugby pitch, uh, scoring a try on debut uh, against the Barbarians at Twickenham. That's pretty good. Would that actually be your most memorable try or do you have a more memorable try? Uh, that's, that's most memorable. Fair enough. And finally, what goes down as your overriding highlight, but also, and also your biggest regret? Oh, that's a tough one. I don't think I have any regrets in, uh, in rugby. I think I've um, made the most of a lot of my opportunities that I've had and I've been able to experience a lot of great things. Um, what was the first question? Overriding achievement. Overriding highlight. Highlight. I'd say the two World Cups. They will be, um, they're, they're up there. I think on that note, we will let you go. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been amazing and best of luck this weekend. Thanks, guys. Thanks Mate, Jerome, me. wishing you the best this weekend. Have you played at Twickenham since the World Cup final in 2015? No. Ooh. I was thinking that. I was thinking yeah. about this. The highlights of your career. You haven't played there since you lifted the Web Ellis there. Yeah, yeah. How good, man. Awesome. All the best this weekend. Yeah. Yeah, We're all rooting for you. Thank you. Oh, man. Thank Go you well. so much. Oh, my God. He's so cool, isn't he? Yeah, he's a lovely guy. Oh, God. He's, and then... he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a humble winner. Yeah, he's so humble. And he's a fucking tough player. Is he? Oh yeah, I'll give him that. I, I like he's. I was saying he's archetypal six. He was just one of those blokes that whoever you had at eight and seven, he just goes around the field manhandling people. You know, melting people, contact area, carrying. He was just a real tough fucker. Um, and you need one of those in your back row. I think if you're going to have any sort of balance, you know, we put all the Sam Simmons you want in your back row, but you need someone to do the do the hard yards and do the dirty work. He was your man. And he was your man for the All Blacks over a decade. So, yeah. you know, in the, one of the best sides of the world. So, yeah, mate, fantastic player. And I, you know, I really hope he uh, he signs off this weekend. Oh, that's amazing. I didn't know he was finishing this year. So we are back with our partners, Manscaped, who are the best in below the belt men's grooming for another installment of Cut of the Week, where we will ask our panel, or Jamie, where I'll ask you to pick your best moment from the weekend's action. So of all the great rugby we saw over the weekend, what goes down as your Manscaped Cut of the Week? My Manscaped Cut of the Week is AJ McGinty's pass under his legs. Did you see it for sale? No, I obviously missed they it. Went, they went the length. They played out their 22. Faf to Clerk, bit of a line break. All the defenders cut him back in and they've offloaded and he's just got the ball passed straight under his legs, I think. Five phases later, um, big ball over the top, they score in the corner. But okay. yeah, sale uh, against Bath at the wreck, McGinty under the legs. That is my Manscaped moment of the week. Uh, well, guys, don't find yourselves being left out and join over 2 million men in using the number one grooming products worldwide. Receive 20% off all of their incredible products and free shipping using the code offload. Your crown jewels will thank you. And to finish off the show, we are bringing back our social 15 to try and fill out the remaining slots and today we're looking for an outside center to join our team so jamie who are you putting forward for selection and why i've played with a few um played with some very loose outside centers as well I, casey lalala brian o'driscoll all very good value on a night out but i am going to go with my ex wales center partner jonathan davis actually many a good night out shared with him top bloke Loves a beer. It's good fun on the beers. Probably my best memory of John is I thought, I actually thought he was dead one night out. We <laughs> we had oh a big God. win up in Scotland. We had a big win up in Murrayfield and we had a um, big night out on George Street. It was one of those, you know, games before a fallow week in the Six Nations. So, mm. you know, you've got a bit of breathing space. Um, you know, if there was a test match next week, you probably wouldn't go out and have a few beers regardless of whether you've won or, won or lost but we had a good win and so we went out had a skimful and I remember just sharing with John and um I came back in the room and he retired to bed probably caught an hour before me and he was he was lying in bed sleeping with his eyes open oh my god it was the freakiest thing ever I, I kind of turned the little like lights next to my bed and I and I looked over him and he's he's lying back and he's sleeping eyes rolled up in the top of his head but his eyes were open 
And I thought he was dead for a second, so I just gave him a little nudge, and he, he kind of kind of shook a bit. But yeah, oh, he's very good value. Very something. good value on the piss, top lad. Yeah, except when you think he's dead. That's not. That's kind of minus points. Well, yeah, I did think he was dead, but luckily he wasn't. Well, look, that is it from us. Thanks to Joe Kano and Jamie Roberts, and thanks to you for listening. More offloading next week. Make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a rating review if you can. And don't forget to check us out on YouTube as well. Thanks, guys.